Good afternoon and welcome back to Stories with Don on this uh, strange day. Snow this morning and right now as I read this, it's nice and sunny. So that's uh, two inches of snow in April. Who would have thought of that? Anyway, we're going to continue uh, with reading The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis, part of the Chronicles of Narnia. And we are now on chapter seven and it is entitled, how the adventure ended. Look at what, said Edmund. Look at the device on the gold, said Caspian. A little hammer with a diamond above it like a star, said Jernian. Why, I've seen that before. Seen it, said Caspian. Why, of course you have. It's the sign of a great Narnian house. This is the Lord Octesian's arm ring. Villain, said Reba Cheap to the dragon, have you devoured a Narnian lord? But the dragon shook his head violently. Or perhaps, said Lucy, this is the Lord Octesian, turned into a dragon, under an enchantment, you know. It needn't be either, said Edmund. All dragons collect gold. But I think it's a safe guess that Octesian got no farther than this island. Are you the Lord Octesian? said Lucy to the dragon. And then, when it sadly shook its head, Are you someone enchanted? Someone human, I mean? It nodded violently. And then someone said, People disputed it afterward, whether Lucy or Edmund said it first. You're not, not Eustace by any chance. And Eustace nodded his terrible dragon head and thumped his tail in the sea and everyone skipped back, some of the sailors with ejaculations I will not put down in writing, to avoid the enormous and boiling tears which flowed from his eyes. Lucy tried hard to console him and even screwed up her courage to kiss the scaly face, and nearly everyone said hard luck, and several assured Eustace that they would all stand by him, and many said they, there was sure to be some way of disenchanting him, and they'd have him write as rain in a day or two. And of course, they were all very anxious to hear his story, but he couldn't speak. More than once in the days that followed, he attempted to write it for them in the sand, but this never succeeded. In the first place, Eustace, never having read the right books, had no idea how to tell the story straight. And for another thing, the muscles and nerves of the dragon claws that he had to use had never learned to reach, had never learned to write and were not built for writing anyway. As a result, he never got nearly to the end before the tide came in and washed away all the writing, except the bits he had already trodden on or accidentally swished out with his tail. And all that anyone had seen would be something like this. The dots are for the bits he had smudged out. And when that to slee, Urgus Argarons, I mean Drangon's cave, because it was dead and aiming so hard, woke up and cup, get off me arm, oh bother. It was, however, clear to everyone that Eustace's character had been rather improved by becoming a dragon. He was anxious to help. He flew over the whole mountain and found that it was all mountainous and inhabited only by wild goats and droves of wild swine. Of these, he brought back many carcasses as provisions for the ship. He was a very humane killer too, for he could dispatch a beast with one blow of his tail so that it didn't know, and presumably still doesn't know, it had been killed. He ate a few himself, of course, but always alone, for now that he was a dragon, he liked his food raw, but he could never bear to let others see him at his messy meals. And one day, flying slowly and wearily, but in great triumph, he bore back to camp a great tall pine tree, which he had torn up by the roots in a distant valley, and which could be made into a capital mast. And in the evening, if it turned chilly, as it sometimes did after the heavy rains, he was a comfort to everyone, because the whole party would come and sit with their backs against his hot sides and get well warmed and dried, 
and one puff of his fiery breath would light the most obstinate fire. Sometimes he would take a select party for a fly on his back, so that they could see wheeling below them the green slopes, the rocky heights, the narrow pit-like valleys, and far out over the sea to the eastward, a spot of darker blue on the blue horizon, which might be land. The pleasure, quite new to him, of being liked, and still more of liking other people, was what kept Eustace from despair. For it was very dreary being a dragon. He shuddered when, whenever he caught sight of his own reflection as he flew over a mountain lake. He hated the huge bat-like wings, the saw-edged ridge on his back, and the cruel curved claws. He was almost afraid to be alone with himself, and yet he was ashamed to be with the others. On the evenings when he was not being used as a hot water bottle, he would slink away from the camp and lie curled up like a snake between the wood and the water. On such occasions, greatly to his surprise, Reepicheep was his most constant comforter. The noble mouse would creep away from the merry circle at the campfire and sit down by the dragon's head, well to the windward to be out of the way of his smoky breath. There he would explain what had happened to Eustace. There he would explain that that what had happened to Eustace was a striking illustration of the turn of fortune's wheel, and that if he had Eustace at his own house in Narnia, it was really a hole and the, not a house, and the dragon's head, let alone his body, would not have fitted in. He could show him more than a hundred examples of emperors, kings, dukes, knights, poets, lovers, astronomers, philosophers, and magicians who had fallen from prosperity into the most distressing circumstances, and of whom many had recovered and lived happily ever afterward. It did not, perhaps, seem so very comforting at the time, but it was kindly meant, and Eustace never forgot it. But of course, what hung over everyone like a cloud was the problem with what to do with their dragon when they were ready to sail. They tried not to talk of it when he was there, but he couldn't help overhearing things like, would he fit all along one side of the deck? And we'd have to shift all our stores to the other side down below so as to balance. Or would towing him be any good? Or would he be able to keep up by flying? And most often of all, but how are we to feed him? And pure Eustace realized more and more that since the first day he came on board, he had been an unmitigated nuisance, and that he was now a greater nuisance still. And this ate into his mind, just as that bracelet ate into his foreleg. He knew that it only made it worse to tear at it with his great teeth, but he couldn't help tearing now and then, especially on hot nights. About six days after they had landed on Dragon Island, Edmund happened to wake up very early one morning. It was just getting gray so that you could see the tree trunks, if they were between you and the bay, but not in the other direction. As he woke, he thought he heard something moving, so he raised himself on one elbow and looked about him. And presently, he thought he saw a dark figure moving on the seaward side of the wood. The idea that at once occurred to his mind was, are we sure there are no natives on this island after all? Then he thought it was Caspian. It was about the right size. But he knew that Caspian had been sleeping next to him and could see that he hadn't moved. Edmund made sure that his sword was in its place and then rose to investigate. He came down softly to the edge of the wood and the dark figure was still there. He saw now that it was too small for Caspian and too big for Lucy. It did not run away. Edmund drew his sword and was about to challenge the stranger when the stranger said in a low voice, Is that you, Edmund? Yes, who are you? Don't you know me? said the other. It's me, Eustace. By Jove, said Edmund, so it is, my dear chap. Hush, said Eustace, and lurched as if he were going to fall. Hello, said Edmund, studying him. What's up? Are you ill? 
Eustace was silent for so long that Edmund thought he was feigning, but at last he said, It's been ghastly. You don't know. But it's all right now. Could we go and talk somewhere? I don't want to meet the others just yet. Yes, rather anywhere you like, said Edmund. We can go and sit on the rocks over there. I say, I am glad to see you, er, looking yourself again. You must have had a pretty beastly time. They went to the rocks and sat down looking out across the bay while the sky got paler and paler and the stars disappeared for one very bright, except for very one bright one, low down and neat and near the horizon. <clears throat> I won't tell you how I became a, a dragon till I can tell the others and get it all over, said Eustace. By the way, I didn't even know it was a dragon till I heard you all using the word when I turned up here the other morning. I want to tell you how I stopped being one. Fire ahead, said Edmund. Well, last night I was more miserable than ever, and that beastly arm ring was hurting like everything. Is that all right now? Eustace laughed, a different laugh from any Eustace had heard him give before, and slipped the bracelet easily off his arm. There it is, he said, and anyone who likes it can have it as far as I'm concerned. Well, as I say, I was lying awake and wondering what <clears throat> what on earth would become of me. And then, but mind you, it may have all been a dream. I don't know. Go on, said Edmund, with considerable patience. Well, anyway, I looked up and I saw the very last thing I expected. A huge lion coming slowly toward me. And one queer thing was that there was no moon last night. But there was moonlight where the lion was. So as it came nearer and nearer, I was terribly afraid of it. You may think that, being a dragon, I could have knocked any lion out easily enough. But it wasn't that kind of fear. I wasn't afraid of it eating me. I was just afraid of it, if you, know, if you can understand. Well, it came up close to me and looked straight into my eyes. And I shut my eyes tight, but that wasn't any good because it told me to follow it. You mean it spoke? I don't know. Now that you mention it, I don't think it did, but it told me all the same. And I knew I'd have to do what it told me, so I got up and followed it. And it led me a long way into the mountains. And there was always this moonlight over and round the line wherever he went. So at last we came to the top of a mountain I'd never seen before. And on the top of the, this mountain, there was a garden, trees and fruit and everything. In the middle of it, there was a well. I knew it was a well because you could see the water bubbling up from the bottom of it. But it was a lot bigger than most wells, like a very big round bath with marble steps going down into it. The water was as clear as anything and I thought if I could get in there and bathe, it would ease the pain in my leg. But the lion told me I must undress first. Mind you, I don't know if he said any words out loud or not. I was just going to say that I couldn't undress because I hadn't any clothes on when I suddenly thought that dragons are snaky sort of things and snakes can cast their skins. Oh, of course, thought I, that's what the lion means. <coughs> Excuse me. So I started scratching myself, and my scales began coming off all over the place. And then I scratched a little deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully, like it does after an illness, or as if I was a banana. In a minute or two, I just stepped out of it. I could see it lying there beside me, looking rather nasty. It was a most lovely feeling. So I started to go down into the well for my bath. But just as I was going to put my feet into the water, I looked down and saw that they were all hard and rough and wrinkled and scaly just as they had been before. Oh, that's all right, said I. It only means I had another smaller suit on underneath the first one and I'll have to get out of it too. So I scratched and tore again and this underskin peeled off beautifully 
and out I stepped and left it lying beside the other one and went down to the well for my bath. Well, exactly the same thing happened again. And I thought to myself, oh dear, however many skins have I got to take off? For I was longing to bathe my leg. So I scratched away for the third time and got off a third skin, just like the two others, and stepped out of it. But as soon as I looked at myself in the water, I knew it had been no good. Then the lion said, But I don't know if it spoke. You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now, so I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked the scab of a sore place, it hurts like Billy. Oh, but it is such fun to see it coming away. I know exactly what you mean, said Edmund. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done, my, done it myself the three other times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there I was, smooth and soft as a peeled switch, and smaller than I had, had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, for I was very tender underneath, now that I had no skin on, and threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious, and as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm, and then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. You'd think me simply phony if I told you how I felt about my own arms. I know they've no muscle and are pretty moldy compared with Caspian's, but I was so glad to see them. After a bit, the lion took me out and dressed me. Dressed you? With his paws? Well, I don't exactly remember that bit, but he did somehow or other in new clothes. The same I've got on now, as a matter of fact. And then suddenly I was back here, which is what makes me think it must have been a dream. No, it wasn't a dream, said Edmund. Why not? Well, there are the clothes, for one thing, and you have been, well, undragoned for another. What do you think it was, then, said Ed, asked Eustace. I think you've seen Aslan, said Edmund. Aslan? said Eustace. I've heard that name mentioned several times since we joined the Don Shredder, and I felt, I don't know what, I hated it. But I was hating everything then, and, and by the way, I'd like to apologize. I'm afraid I've been pretty beastly. That's all right, said Edmund. Between ourselves, you haven't been as bad as I was on my first trip to Narnia. You were only an ass, but I was a traitor. Well, don't tell me about it then, said Eustace. But who is Aslan? Do you know him? Well, he knows me, said Edmund. He is the great lion, the son of the emperor beyond the sea who saved me and saved Narnia. We've all seen him. Lucy sees him most often. And it may be Aslan's country we are sailing to. Neither said anything for a while. The last bright star had vanished, and though they could not see the sunrise because of the mountains on their right, they knew it was going on because the sky above them and the bay before them turned the color of roses. Then some bird of the parrot kind screamed in the wood behind them. They heard movements among the trees, and finally a blast on Caspian's horn. The camp was astir. <clears throat> Great was the rejoicing when Edmund and the restored Eustace walked into the breakfast circle round the campfire. And now, of course, everyone heard the earlier part of his story. People wondered whether the other dragon had killed the Lord Octesian several years ago, 
or whether Actesian himself had been the old dragon. The jewels with which Eustace had crammed his pockets in the cave had disappeared along with his clothes he had then been wearing, but no one, least of all Eustace himself, felt any desire to go back to that valley for more treasure. In a few days now the in a few days now the Dawn Treader, remasted, repainted, and well stored, was ready to sail. Before they embarked, Caspian caused to be cut on a smooth cliff facing the bay the words Dragon Island, discovered by Caspian the tenth, King of Narnia, etc., in the fourth year of his reign. Here, as we suppose, the Lord Octesian had his death. It would be nice and fair, fairly nearly true to say that from that time forth, Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could be very tiresome, but most of these I shall not notice. The cure had begun. The Lord Octesian's arm ring had a curious faith. Eustace did not want it and offered it to Caspian, and Caspian offered it to Lucy. She did not care about having it. Very well, then. Catch as catch can, said Caspian, and flung it up into the air. This was when they were all standing looking at the inscription. Up went the ring, flashing in the sunlight and caught, and hung, as nearly as a well-thrown quoit on a little projection on the rock. No one could climb up to get it from below, and no one could climb down to get it from above. And there, for all I know, it is hanging still, and may hang till the world ends. And here's a picture. I don't know if you can see that very well, but... And that's the end of that chapter. So use this is back to almost normal, to his new normal, as we say nowadays, learning to become a nice young man instead of a bratty boy. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, chapter. I hope that you are well and that you may stay that way, and may God bless you. Goodbye. <laughs>